So let me very quickly introduce you. I'll take very little time because I want you to have as much time as possible. Um, doc, I think some of you may already know Dr. Higgins. She is currently an associate research scientist with the National Center for Education within the Institute of Education Sciences at the Department of Education. Big, long, long name of the institution. Yes, uh, it she, is. <laughs> she is also the program manager for cognition and student learning at IES. Um, mm -hmm. And she does a lot of work, she has also done a lot of work, and she supports work at the intersection of cognition and learning and technology. At least that's my take from, from the kind of things that you do. Okay. That's right. It's a delight yep. to have you here. Thank you so much, and it's all yours now. Great. Well, and thank you for inviting me. Um, it's really great to have an opportunity to do a more of a deep dive into um, this research portfolio and uh, to talk to people who might be interested in funding specifically in the cognition and student learning space. So um, I hope this is useful for you uh, just to even think about the work that you do in more of an applied way and, and the kinds of benefits that you can get for your own research in doing that, but also I think as a way to, to think about potential funding avenues in the future. And, um, and I'm happy to talk to you um, about any of those things throughout this talk in more specific details than what I have here. So, um, so we can kind of move along with your interests, and uh, and so feel free to stop me at any time and ask questions. And again, I'm happy to to go into more details. Um, so, so as you can see from my title, the goal here is really to talk about what this intersection of cognitive science and education looks like. Um, and I'll talk from the perspective of, of what's been funded through IES, but of course there's a lot more work going on in the field. And so these are just some examples, but um, there's a lot of exciting work in this space right now. Uh, and so the goal today is to give you a sense of what this program is all about, talk a little bit about the Institute of Education Sciences if you're unfamiliar with what we do, um, and then uh, I'll move into some examples of what uh, is coming out of the current portfolio of, of research that we have. Uh, and, and I think that those examples will be useful, um, again, both for, for informing your own work, but also I think as, as a way to see what are the kinds of things you could do with funding through this program. Um, I think people are surprised to see that some of the things they're already doing could actually um, fit under the Cognition and Student Learning Program, where I think they had um, an assumption that you have to be way more applied in order to come to IES, and I think that's not necessarily true. We have, um, we have the ability to do translational science, uh, not just completely applied science. And so I think that a lot of the cognitive scientists really sit nicely in that translational science space. And I think that this program in, partic in particular really supports that kind of work um, well for, for education research. Uh, and then I'll end with uh, more specifics about funding and kind of what, what I think the open questions are at a broad level, um, and then also what makes a, a project uh, in this program successful, which again, I think you can take away uh, to inform your own work and also to think about applying to our program. Again, feel free to ask me questions at any time. I'll caveat this whole thing by saying um, that as a program officer at IES, um, we spend a lot of time talking to applicants in the uh, conceptualization of their applications, and then we step away when it comes to peer review. So, um, so I have no bearing on the peer review process, so the kinds of things I highlight here as potentially open questions are what I'm seeing coming out of this portfolio and, and kind of where I see potential gaps in our knowledge, but, um, but by no means does that drive what reviewers might find important, right? So, so if you choose to pursue those things, it's up to you to make a case for the scientific merit of that work. And then external reviewers are the ones that will come in and say, yes, this seems to have merit or, you know, you know, maybe maybe it needs to be tweaked in this way or that way. Um, I think that this is a real benefit of IES in that uh, we as program officers can spend so much time talking to applicants. We can do things like review drafts of proposals, which is something that, for example, NSF program officers are not really able to do. So I think in that way, um, we are a real resource for the community. Um, but do keep that part of it in mind that we're not part of the review process as you um, listen to this talk.
So uh, for those of you not so familiar with IES, I just want to spend a brief second talking about what who we are. Uh, so we are the research arm of the Department of Education, and we're intended to be objective and also quite independent of the rest of the department. And so our goals um, as a broad institute are to describe the condition and progress of education in the United States, uh, to identify the kinds of education practices that improve academic achievement and educational opportunity access and then finally to evaluate the effectiveness of federal programs but also other education programs that might be out there policies lots of different kinds of things like that um, and we have four centers that uh, have different um, specific goals that align to these missions and so, for example, the National Center for Education Statistics is, is more of the, the group that looks at describing the condition of, of the United States uh, education system, whereas the Education Research Center, which is where I am from, and also the National Center for Special Education Research, were very focused on that kind of innovation and research and development piece of the legislative mission. So um, what comes out of our two centers are the discretionary grants programs primarily. Uh, and these include everything from training programs for education researchers to um, programs to try to improve researcher practitioner partnerships and then our main flagship grant program which is the education research grants program and that is the program that the cognition and student learning uh, topic is housed under and that's where uh, I'll spend most of my time uh, talking today. So as I've already alluded to, the mission of these two centers is to support research. So under the National Center for Education Research, it's uh, research from early childhood to post-secondary and adult education for uh, what we would call typically developing students, um, but really all students. And the, the goal is to try to identify and then address the most pressing education needs. Um, for our sister center, the Special Education Research Center, the goal is to uh, look at special education research and try to understand uh, how to improve learning for infants, toddlers, and then students up through grade 12. And within both of these, we have a cognition and student learning program. So if you're interested in special education, there are uh, mechanisms to go into uh, for that center uh, and, and apply to, to grant programs there. Across both centers, we have some shared research objectives, and um, there, there are a couple of them. So one of them is to develop or identify things that um, could potentially work, that is interventions like practices, instructional practice programs, policies, um, approaches to learning that are enhancing academic achievement, but that also could be widely deployed and that are feasible for classroom use. And then another goal is to identify what maybe doesn't work uh, in order to encourage further development and innovation. Uh, and this is really critical in this space, I think, because there's a lot of stuff that's already out there that people are adopting and using, and we just don't know if those things are effective or not. And so um, we really push hard for people to come in and do strong efficacy studies of widely used interventions to answer this question about, you know, is this something that works or not? And is this something that is worth states' investments given their limited resources? And then finally, um, the, there's a goal of understanding the processes that underlie the effectiveness of interventions and then variations in those. So what works under what conditions and for whom. And I think that um, the value of the, the uh, cognition and student learning program really lies in this, this last space. That is, you know, we can, un we can use what we know from cognitive science to try to understand the cognitive processes that maybe underlie reading or underlie math um, and figure out how to then intervene on those processes to improve uh, academic achievement. Okay, so I've talked broadly about IES, so now I'll just uh, quickly talk specifically about this cognition and student learning program. The purpose is to support research that takes what we know about how the mind works from cognitive science, cognitive neuroscience, and then apply it to education practice with the goal of identifying and developing tools and strategies that uh, are efficacious for improving learning. And um, from this program, you can apply to a number of different what we call research goals, which is basically I'm going to run the spectrum from kind of 
translational science through the more applied, you know, efficacy and evaluation kinds of studies. So, um, so an exploration study uh, that, that we refer to here would be something where you'd identify factors, let's say, of instruction or student skills that seem to be correlated with um, academic achievement in some way. Um, and the value of the exploration work is in identifying the kinds of things that we could potentially change through the education system and intervene upon. And that exploration work would then serve as the foundation for the development of um, interventions like tools and education technology products and those kinds of things. Um, the development and innovation goal is exactly as it sounds. The idea is that you would develop an intervention. You'd be pulling from what we know about uh, you know, the cognitive science um, of learning and you'd then be developing a curriculum or a, an ed education technology tool. Efficacy and replication is evaluation of whatever developed product you'd be choosing to, to look at. And effectiveness is a similar kind of thing. I won't go into the distinction between them. Just think of both of them as, as evaluations. Um, and then finally, the measurement goal um, is focused on developing measures for use in, in classrooms or uh, at least in a school setting. It may, it may be for administrators uh, and others to use to, to look at student outcomes. Okay, I'll stop there since I just threw a lot of information about IES at you and see if you have any questions before I go on. I have one quick question. You had mentioned earlier all the way from K-12 to adult education. So IES is open to studies about college level education? Yes, um, under certain con conditions. So um, we have a post-secondary and adult education topic. And under that, um, there are specific outcomes that you can focus on. So it's not just all undergraduate work. It's specific to things like gateway STEM uh, classes and um, college completion is another thing. So if you have an intervention that you think would improve college completion, that's something you could focus on. So it's a specific subset of outcomes under the post-secondary space. And then adult education similarly has a, a specific set of outcomes that one could focus on. Um, I don't have them off the top of my head, but um, but again, it's really focused on those, um, those kind of sticking areas like like you know developmental math for example is a barrier to uh to going on in adult education so those are the kinds of things uh that you would be thinking about in that space and i would say um you know it it's a great space for cognitive scientists to move into as well because um many of us do work with adults that is, you know, college students in the laboratory. And I think moving to the adult education research is a natural progression from that. It's a very different population from your typical undergraduates, but um, it also has some similarities that maybe, you know, the second grade population doesn't have. Um, I would also urge you to think about, we have a, an effective teachers program that focuses on teacher professional development and training. And, and that's another space where I think um, as cognitive scientists, if you think about the teacher as the learner, I think we have a lot of um, impact. We, we potentially have a lot of impact on that and that space as well. And that's something that the Cognition and Student Learning Program does not touch on. Um, so if you were interested in teacher professional development, you would go to that effective teachers topic. Another Other question? questions? Uh, yes. Uh, do, does IES uh, do anything in the uh, special needs education space? Yeah, so we have this special education center uh, that is our sister center, and they have the basically similar grant programs as what we offer. Um, and they also have a cognition and student learning in special education topic. Um, and so uh, it's, a, it's a smaller portfolio at this point. It, it has a smaller number of grants than what's been funded under the program here in the Center for Education Research. Um, but yeah, it's, it's certainly something that uh, is of interest there. And I think um, if you're interested in special education, I would strongly urge you to, to consider that because uh, I think that there's a lot, again, from cognitive science that we can use to inform um, how to improve the special education of, of those students. Thank you. Yeah. Other questions? Okay.
Well, then I will move on to talk a little more specifically about CASEL and, and again, then launch into these examples. So um, this is just to give you a sense of some of the, the stats around this program. So this program's been around since the beginning of IES, which was 2002. It's one of our oldest programs. Um, at this point, we have funded 143 grants, and that um, represents over $190 million in investment. So it's a pretty substantial investment relative to um, the the rest of the the education research centers uh, portfolios um, what you'll see I think from this graph is that a lot of the work is in this exploration and development space uh, and I think that that's reflective of the kinds of people who come into the program you know most of them do laboratory research they're not um, thinking about efficacy trials of full-blown curriculum instead they're trying to figure out you know what factors matter and try to understand the theoretical landscape that underlies learning and and again I think that's that's why we see this trend in, in more exploration and development work that said there's a growing number of efficacy studies that have been coming in so notably this year we are funding a study that's looking at working memory uh, interventions and contrasting a number of different ones against a business as usual control and i think those are that's an example of the kind of thing that could come in under cognition and student learning as an efficacy study um, and i think that we'll see more and more as the field continues to mature um, what you'll also note from this graph is there are very few measurement projects in this area um, in fact, in my next slide, I, I have this breakdown of, of just the proportion of grants by goal, and you'll see it's about 4%, so it's a very small number. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been trying to figure out why, why this is the case. Um, I think across the board, we tend to fund less measurement work than, than our other goals, but, um, but specifically in CASEL, I think part of the issue is that, number one, many of these uh, applicants coming in are not measurement people you know they're not they're not thinking about how to develop educational measures and tools um, but that said I mean we have as cognitive scientists the skill set to develop strong measures so I think that the skill sets there we, we just might not think of ourselves as you know educational measurement people yet and and I don't like to argue that maybe we should because if we start to, and, and as we continue to identify processes that underlie reading and math, you know, things like spatial thinking and executive function skills, those things potentially might need to be measured in the classroom context. And the kinds of ways that we would measure it in the classroom might look very different than how we do it in the laboratory. So our laboratory measures might not hold up. And I think that more work needs to be done to try to validate and, and identify reliable measures that could be used in a classroom context that really focus on those kinds of things. Um, so that's an area I think where, where we could do better. Um, I'll also show you, so th there are a couple other graphs here. Um, this one is by, uh, by age group studied. You'll see that a lot of the work is actually in the elementary and middle school space. There's, there's a lot less in high school, which in some ways is surprising because a lot of these uh, researchers are coming from kind of an undergraduate laboratory context. It's surprising that they wouldn't naturally go straight to high school. I think part of that explanation is there's a lot of complex content going on in high school, and so it's it's difficult to kind of jump in and be like, I'm going to try to figure out how to teach calculus, as opposed to saying I'm going to try to figure out, you know, the best practices for addition and subtraction. I also think that a stronger case can be made for foundational mathematics skills, for example, in elementary and middle school grades. You know, those are the things that that we need to do better in terms of teaching students. So like, you know, fractions, algebra, et cetera. And that also might be part of the reason why you see this trend. These are just I'm trying to read into it. I don't know for sure if these are the things that, that are driving this, but it, it's just interesting to think about. And I would again say that, that uh, you know, more could be done in high school um, across content areas. I think, uh, I think that there's a lot of room there for some interesting work. And then lastly, another graph I'll show you here is just by content area. And this is just to show that we have a nice mix of reading, math, and science work. Um, we have very little work in the writing space. So that's a space where I think that things are wide open. I think that um, given some of the, the state's standards um, continued focus toward more writing in the content areas is, is um, maybe driving 
uh, potential interest in writing, at least in the practice side of things, but the research hasn't necessarily come forward yet uh, in that space. So that's something to keep an eye on. What this, gra or what this graph also doesn't show you is that we have a lot of science research in the middle and high school grades, but we haven't funded much in the more pre-K and early elementary school space. And so that's potentially an area um, where, where one could do a little bit more. Questions around this stuff? I had a question. Yeah. All right, so you're talking about uh, the percentage of proposals that are funded is, are those percentages roughly equal to the number of proposals that are submitted for each of those? Or is it Good that question. the measured yeah. ones don't fare very well with the reviewers? That is a really great question. And so we haven't, at this point, we don't have those data to play with. So those data exist, they're, they're in a, the standards and review office. And um, and I think it would be really interesting to, to try to ask that question. I would say just anecdotally, um, we tend to not get a lot of writing proposals, for example. I would say the same is probably true for high school. There's a lot less relative to the middle and elementary school space. Um, so, so that's just anecdotally, but I, I don't have the stats to back it up, unfortunately. And our office, interestingly, doesn't actually release numbers of submitted applications. So all we have to work with here to, you know, to talk to you guys about is really what's been funded. So, but thanks. Good question. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to switch gears then and talk about what it is that's coming out of this work. And I think that um, these examples are just, again, really useful for thinking about the kinds of things you could come in and do. And I tried to pick things that show a number of different methodological approaches and data collection techniques, again, to show you the, the breadth of what you could come in with. And I'll start with reading. So what do we know from the cognitive science of reading comprehension that can inform practice um, and what's been done specifically under this uh, cognition and student learning topic? So, um, you know, a huge amount of knowledge has amassed about what we do when we read. So we build conceptual models of text for example, we can represent connections of different kinds between sentences. We can draw inferences from text. Um, however, we vary as readers in the kinds of models that we come up with from reading a text. So you and I can read the same text and we might come up with completely different understandings of what happened, especially if I'm a struggling reader and you are a, a very good reader. And so um, a lot of behavioral work has gone into trying to figure out why we get differences in comprehension, um, but it can only do so much. Uh, and so, um, Paul Vandenbroek and colleagues and some others have, have made this point that behavioral data is only going to tell us part of the story. Um, and instead, why not think about other methods like eye tracking and these kinds of things that we could bring to bear on this question to try to figure out how to intervene with these students who are struggling. So. Um, for example, in a study that he did, he used eye tracking to try to identify different groups of struggling readers. So these are readers who have the same exact scores on a reading comprehension task. So if you used only behavioral data, you wouldn't be able to say that these groups were different in any way. But when you look at what they're doing with their eyes, you have a group of readers who's go who are going from word to word and, uh, and they're not kind of spending more time strategically on some words than others. And then you have a completely different group of uh, poor comprehenders who are jumpy readers. So they're moving their eyes across sentences, um, jumping to irrelevant parts of text. And from that, you can think about, you know, these are completely different groups with different issues that would require different kinds of instruction in order to address this reading comprehension problem. Um, and so that's, that's the conclusion that Paul and his colleagues came to was, you know, we have to use these other kinds of techniques to try to identify what's going on um, so that we can come up with appropriate ways of intervening. And the behavioral data will only get us so far. As another example, um, this is a study by Carol Connor and colleagues um, who showed that uh, if you look at, at students with poor academic language skills, um, they're actually able to, to recognize inconsistencies in text, just like students with good skills, but then they differ in how they um, 
deal with these inconsistencies in text. So if you look at their eye gaze data, you find that those with high academic language skills are going back and rereading the text that seems inconsistent. And the ones that do not have uh, those skills are just kind of plowing through the text and, and reading it verbatim and not going back and, and trying to you know, resolve inconsistencies. And so, again, it gives you a, a window into what's going on and why they're struggling and potentially a way to then intervene and help these students become better readers. Um, one could also use eye tracking to identify mind wandering, for example. So um, this is a study by Scott uh, Ardoin and colleagues who showed that if you look at readers um, who are struggling, poor readers actually mindlessly read particular sections of text and they're more likely to show this kind of behavior. And if you look at um, what's going on here, you see many more um, Gaze, gazes to the the words. Then, if you if you look at the uh, the other section, the fixations in the in the mindlessly reading section are few and far between. Um, as another example, one could actually use event related potentials to study reading. Uh, and so you could, this is um, Jonathan Schooler and colleagues, you could look at when individuals are mind wandering, wandering. in this case he used self-report, um, and then back sort uh, and look at, you know, those cases where you self-reported mind wandering versus cases where you did not. And what he finds is that you have distinct brain patterns that are predictive of reading comprehension. Um, and you can use these to try to, one, try to covertly detect mind wandering, which is more of a research goal, I think, than than a practice one, but then you could think about ways to develop brain-based interventions based on what we know about these brain patterns and, and what they mean for attention um, to try to then remediate this problem. So um, I think that, that the reading comprehension work here is a, just a really nice example of, of the kinds of techniques you could bring to bear on this work. Um, you can imagine doing these kinds of things in the laboratory and then going into a classroom and trying different techniques for intervening. And um, in, in one of the next examples, I'll get to uh, that's exactly the kind of approach that, that a, a particular researcher is using. And um, again, I think that we learn a lot about um, students who are struggling, who might look the same on, on a behavioral test, but in fact have very different needs and would require different kinds of interventions. So I'll stop there and see if you have any questions about any of those studies. Okay. Great. Well, then I will um, shift gears and go to uh, to mathematics, where I think there's a lot of really exciting things going on. I picked this one line of work because I think there's um, there's a number of people in this space right now who have been funded through IES, and it's just a nice story. But um, but there's again just a lot going on in STEM, um, as you know, probably from not even being an education researcher, but just from listening to the the news. There's excitement around STEM careers. There's a push for um, trying to improve STEM learning. Uh, across the United States, and, and we're certainly seeing it here with, I think, a stronger emphasis on STEM in the applications that come through. Um, and so what I find fascinating about this particular line of work around what do we know about perception and how does it inform math is that you take a, a relatively abstract um, way of thinking, you know, mathematics, and yet what we're finding is that it's grounded in a lot of ways in, in perception, in how we see the world, um, and we can take advantage of that to try to improve students' understanding of mathematics. So, um, so take a classic cognitive science finding like this one, right, where um, you uh, remember more information if you're tested in the environment in which you studied that information. So this is the classic scuba diving and studying words and then standing on dry land and studying words and then you're either tested in the same or different environment. Um, we get this nice interaction. So the reason I'm showing this is um, Steve Frankenary and his colleagues are asking, you know, how do you teach uh, kids about main effects and interactions? How do we do that? Uh, and how do we improve their skills? What are experts doing that novices don't do? And then can we impact um, instruction in such a way to teach novices to do what experts are doing? 
So he is um, also using eye tracking, but also behavioral research to look at how visual op uh, routines operate across different kinds of graphs, graphs that show main effects versus interactions, different kinds of judgments you'd make about a graph. So are you asking is something more than something else or am I asking you something more complex? He's also looking at whether you can manipulate students' visual routines. Can I get you to change your gaze from left to right or right to left, and how does that impact graph comprehension? And then finally, given what we know about these first two questions, can we then see if we can teach students comprehension enhancing routines? So again, this is the example I, I was pointing to earlier where you're doing this basic laboratory work where you're trying to unpack what students are looking at and individual differences in gaze patterns um, to then inform future instructional practice kinds of research where they're going into classrooms, they're developing um, small scale instructional approaches that they could do in the matter of you know an hour with these kids to try to improve their comprehension of these graphs. Um, this work is ongoing so I don't have a lot of findings to talk about but he uh, he did alert me to the fact that you know their, their projects maturing and they have a lot that will be coming out in the next year and so if you're interested in this work certainly go to his website and, and keep track on what's going on here. Um, relatedly we have some work by Jennifer Cromley and her colleagues looking at um, how do students coordinate multiple representations of the same function so, uh, so for example, the same function can be represented through this table, through a graph, et cetera. And what she asked was, what do experts do versus novices in terms of trying to identify when a representation is the same as another versus when it's not? And so again, she used eye tracking to try to look at gaze patterns to see what are successful students doing differently than those who are unsuccessful. And what she finds is that the successful students seem to use the same kind of strategy to process this information. And then those that are unsuccessful are doing a number of different kind of wacky things. And the idea would be then to understand why are these successful students successful and can we get those who are struggling to, uh, to have the same kinds of visual routines that would allow them to identify effectively when one representation matched another. Um, one, one other project that's related that I don't have on here um, is by Martha Ali Bali and her colleagues. It's kind of a similar idea to these last two, uh, two studies where she's looking at how to coordinate multiple representations, usually a graph and an equation, um, and ways that we can capitalize on what we know from attention and, and uh, perception to do that, and also gesture. Um, you know, are there ways to push people to focus on one thing versus another that would then aid them in efficiently saying, yes, these things match, this is the same function as that one. Um, another example of how we can take perception and apply it to education is um, a set of development and efficacy studies with by Phil Kelman and his colleagues. So he's been funded through a couple of different IES grants and also through our small business uh, research program and development program, um, SBIR. Uh, he's been funded to, to develop this uh, perceptual learning modules intervention. And what he's doing here is um, he's, he's using what we know about pattern matching to develop an intervention where students aren't actually solving problems. Instead, they're trying to figure out um, different categories of problems, really. So is this problem the same or different from another problem that's kind of the target problem? Um, and through this classification, uh, students are, are abstracting the relevant, uh, con the relevant kind of determining features of a particular concept, and that's helping them understand the mathematical principles that they have to learn. So, so the idea is that in order to solve a problem, you know, you need to know more th than just how to apply the solution. You need to really understand the mathematical concept so that you can identify it and do all these other things. And this intervention is intended to do that. It's also um, self-paced, it's adaptive. So he's, he's developed a number of other pieces of it. There's feedback and these things are all playing a role in, in improving students learning and he's finding some very promising results. So um, the perceptual learning modules seem to be improving academic achievement in math, um, both immediately, but also at a four month delay relative to just business as usual.
And again, he's taking what we know from pattern matching and applying it here uh, to mathematics, and he's getting these nice big effects. Um, this is not something that takes up a ton of time, so it's appealing from that perspective as a homework assignment or as a way to do extra practice in, in classes. And, uh, and I think that's another point here to make, which is that a lot of the work that comes out of this portfolio is not... Um, it's not interventions that take up a ton of time. It's, it's things that are kind of quick fixes. Um, and so I'll go through a couple of other examples of, of these kind of quick fixes that one could do that are making huge impacts, and this specifically is in math. So um, as an example, um, this is Vladimir Slavsky and Jennifer Kaminsky who have shown that um, simply changing a graph for six to eight year olds when, when they're learning about graphs from um, a very commonly used uh, kind of item by item bar graph uh, approach to a more abstract graph the way we are typically used to seeing them actually improves students use of correct strategies for graph comprehension. So in the prior case, what those students tend to do is count apples, for example. And so if the number of apples doesn't align to the number on the, the y axis, then you're doing it wrong, right? So counting apples is kind of like a crutch that you're using. You're not actually learning to read the graph as intended and showing these more abstract um, bars actually enables that to happen. And so, uh, so that's just an example of a very quick change to instructional practice, right? So showing this kind of graph instead that's leading to big differences in, in how students learn to comprehend graphs. As another example, Kelly Mix and colleagues have shown that uh, kindergartners learn about multi-digit numbers faster when they learn through numerals uh, than with manipulatives, which is interesting because, uh, you know, there's a lot of assumptions out there, I think, um, that manipulatives are better for learning uh, about early number, and here's the case where that's not necessarily true. And so, again, you could imagine a very quick fix of just teaching about multi-digit numerals using numbers instead of uh, manipulatives. And finally, another example here is, um, is some work by Nicole McNeil and colleagues um, where the goal is to try to understand that the equal sign means mathematical equivalence. Um, and you would think that this is something that kids would be able to understand pretty easily, um, but in fact it's a really hard uh, concept and kids struggle with it and it has impacts later on when it comes to algebra and other things. Um, and so her idea of how to, how to address this is actually to just give students problems that have the operations on the other side. So kids are used to seeing um, the operations on the left side. Um, why not then give them problems where they're on the right side? And that change alone leads to huge uh, performance differences in, uh, in, in math tests later. So uh, students who are given both the operations on the right and, and operations on the left problems show much better math achievement than those who are just getting the business as usual math, uh, you know, uh, operations on the on the left. So, um, and this this work is now um, we just funded an efficacy study to to look at the efficacy of this particular intervention. Um, and again, it's not something that requires a huge change. It's really a small shift in how we uh, approach instruction of this particular concept. So I just went over a bunch of things. Um, again, I'll stop now and, and see if you have any questions. This is fascinating, uh, I think, uh, in part because it touches on the problem of an ongoing debate about different learning styles and different thinking styles, right? So that debate is still going on. Um, and I think what some of these projects are indicating is that the use of perceptual representations and perceptual reasoning might in fact lead to more effective learning. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think it depends on what it is that you're learning, right? And so I think that some of the open questions are around when does this work and when doesn't it, you know, and, and specifically in mathematics, when do you need to move to a more abstract uh, type of instructional approach, um, given that a lot of these approaches are now being grounded in, in perception. You know, when, when do you make that leap? Because, you know, certainly experts um, are not offloading as much on their perception as novices might, right? So, so I think there's a lot of really interesting open questions still, but, um, but certainly I think we're coming up with a, a strong 
um, line of work now that suggests that if we use what we know about perception, we can really make some strong gains in early math learning. Any other questions? Okay, I could come up with a number of these examples. These are just some um, that have been coming out recently. But again, I, I want to um, emphasize that I think this is just one of the really, um, this is a strength of this program is, you know, we're not talking about huge expensive curriculum changes, really. We're, we're talking about really um, small scale kinds of things that, that if you just were to tell a teacher do this instead of that, they would be able to implement it. It doesn't require a ton of support and coaching, doesn't require a lot of money. So um, again, I think, you know, this isn't everything coming out of Castle. There are certainly some things that are much larger scale, but this is definitely one of the, the real benefits of a lot of this work. So I'll, I'll shift gears now and uh, give you a, another set of examples as food for thought for, you know, what what does this work do for theoretical contributions and, and kind of our basic understanding of how the mind works? So I want to argue that uh, you can do this work from a basic science perspective and get a lot out of it. You can think of the education setting as a, just a really interesting real world space to test your theory um, and a maybe a different context than the laboratory. Uh, and so as an example of that, I'll just take an, e this is a pretty easy one. So how does our memory system work? The memory work's been applied in a lot of cases to, um, sorry, that's my phone. Hopefully you don't hear it. <laughs> anyway, the memory work's been applied um, a lot to, to education. And, um, and so there's a lot of work that's been done already in this space. But I think it's a really nice example of how you can kind of go back and forth from the applied space to the basic science space. Um, and so uh, this is a question that's been addressed for a long time. We know a lot about how our memory system works. And so, for example, um, you know, one finding that comes out of it is that retrieval practice improves memory. And knowing that helps us understand what's going on in encoding and retrieval. You know, maybe there's something about desirable difficulties that improves encoding and allows for better retrieval. Maybe it's just the practice of doing the kind of thing that you would do on a later test that enables better retrieval. Many different kinds of theories out there about it. But anyway, the, the main laboratory finding is that uh, retrieval practice improves memory. And so Roddy Rodiger and Jeff Karpicki and others have been focused on this issue for a long time. Um, they came to IES and received funding um, through a number of different grants to look at retrieval practice in the classroom. Um, and Roddy Rodiger looked mainly at middle and high school, and he found that uh, retrieval practice improves learning uh, over and above rereading text and doing some passive study techniques that are typically used in the classroom. And so that work was really fascinating and it was just a great example of applying um, this finding to the classroom. Jeff Karpicki did a similar thing, but he actually moved to fourth grade science classrooms. And that's the project I wanna talk about briefly um, here. So, so he uh, looked at elementary school children who read, um, in this case, four science texts and he asked, you know, does retrieval practice improve their understanding of these texts and their ability to recall the information later? And he predicted that out of these four um, conditions here, so concept mapping, recalling information from text, which is essentially that retrieval practice condition, cued recall, and then some control, he predicted that, of course, retrieval practice is going to improve learning. We know that from the laboratory. We know it from other work. It's, it's going to work. So he gave all these students a final test four days later, and the idea again was that we'd see this huge effect of retrieval practice on learning, and so then we could make the strong recommendation that this is how teachers should to do things in the classroom. Well, so here's a, a table of what he found, and I'll walk you through this. So in this uh, first period one, period two, these are technically study periods. So the concept mapping group did one concept map. They didn't do anything for a second time. They just created it once. The free recall group recalled things twice. And that's why you have period one and two. Cued recall, same way. Control condition did nothing. Um, and what you're seeing here are accuracy of recalling information pieces from the text. You're seeing a seven and a 9% recall rate. Contrast this with what you find with college students where you're seeing about 75%-ish recall rates. 
Um, and so what this means for your final test is that you're not going to see the retrieval practice effect, right? Because essentially these kids didn't engage in retrieval practice. They couldn't remember anything. And this was just a huge surprise for Jeff. And, um, and this paper I'm referencing, referencing down here, kind of, it's a really nice one for kind of giving the story of this surprise um, with experiment one, which is the one I'm showing you here, and then kind of what to do next. And, and so hugely surprising. He, he then had to rethink, you know, how do I take this retrieval practice effect that I know is supposed to work and make it work in an elementary school classroom. And that has led to an entirely new line of work around how best to scaffold retrieval practice, which he's then taken back into the laboratory to try to understand more about how do we improve encoding um, with young children with more complex tasks than what we see in the laboratory with more complex materials. It's just a fascinating line of work that I think wouldn't have been uh, made possible had he not tried to pull this finding that's been you know studied many many times in the laboratory to this particular context so again what works in the laboratory may not always generalize to real world settings you've got complexity of information all sorts of other things going on the task looks a little bit different there's so many contextual factors to think about it's just a fascinating setting to work in um, and I think that there's just a lot of basic science questions that can be answered from doing that kind of exercise of moving back and forth between the lab and the classroom. Any questions about that work? Also the stage of cognitive development, because the children are a different stage of cognitive development than college students are, right? So this can lead to very interesting theoretical issues about how does this relate with cognitive science theories of cognitive development? Yes, I agree. Yeah, and I and I think that working in this space forces you to think about the cognitive development question front and center. Yeah. So, as another quick example, um, I wanted to talk about another another way that I think that this work can inform basic science, which is. You know, in the laboratory, we have a tendency to focus on one change, right? We manipulate one thing really cleanly and we get a nice effect. And so we know a lot about that one thing. But we're reluctant to look at what happens when we make multiple changes uh, across conditions, right? I mean, that to us as cognitive scientists is like violating all principles of, of research design. Why would you do it? But on the other hand, I think we need to think about how cognitive principles interact with each other. So again, back to the memory example, how does spacing interact with retrieval practice and other kinds of factors that one can think about that are all supposed to improve memory that have been studied independently? How do you, how do you kind of combine them and what does that mean for improvements in learning? And so we have um, a research and development center. So this is not a CASEL discretionary grant. This is something a little bit different. This is one of our national R&D centers um, on cognition and math instruction. And their main question is, how do we engineer a better math curriculum by knowing, applying what we know from cognitive science? So they took a curriculum called Connected Mathematics and they are evaluating the efficacy of what they've done to redesign it against its normal version. If you're interested, here's the website uh, to go to. And um, this work's still ongoing, but I wanted to give you a sense of what they're doing because I think it's just a nice example of how you could address this question of how do these different cognitive principles interact with each other. So, um, so this is just to, to show you the kinds of uh, cognitive principles they're focused on. So they have uh, three in particular. So they're looking at visual and verbal interactions. Um, so how do you, when do you decide to present visual information versus just having it in, in text form? Um, they're looking at spacing and worked examples. And then they are also, hold on, I want to get this right. They're looking at I'm um, oh, sorry, interleaved work examples, and then finally spacing and formative assessment. So those are two separate things. So those are the three principles that they're working on and trying to implement in their curriculum. And so some of them are easy. So like removing irrelevant visual content, uh, content. that's an easy one to do. It's easy to identify in the curriculum. 
you know, here's an example of a picture that's distracting and not necessary. They use eye tracking to try to identify these. So um, they'll have students look at the text. If they're spending too much time on their relevant picture, it makes sense to remove it. Uh, here's a, another example, though, and this is a much harder way to do it. So um, in this case, they've revised a graph. You can't really tell how unless you know exactly what you're looking for. They have basically added these descriptions to uh, identify what the lines are. And so these kinds of ways of implementing visual verbal mapping, they had to think through in a little bit more detail, and it was difficult to implement. Um, another thing they had to do is figure out where to put worked examples and how those fit into the text. And then from there, I'll uh, go through that. Uh, sorry. From there, they had to figure out spacing and these other things. And what they found is uh, that it's really hard to, uh, to do worked examples and spacing at the same time. So adding worked examples affects the spacing of, of content across the curriculum. Anyway, these things are all interacting and making it really complicated to say, here's the optimal way to combine these things. You really don't know. Um, and so th this is all kind of open and, and then there's just the act of applying it to the curriculum, implementing a concept for a cognitive principle, and that alone is difficult. So that they found this to be a really hard task, and I think um, it's indicative of where we are as a group and that we don't think about um, putting these principles together, and we need to think more about that and what that means and how these things interact. Um, quickly, they, they are in the middle of analyzing their data from their efficacy studies. They have some preliminary results that suggest that the units that they've developed seem to be improving outcomes, though not for every unit of instruction. Um, they have a conference coming up in April in Washington, D.C. Information is going to be made available, I think, on their website. So this is of interest to you um, and you'll be in D.C. in April or want to come to D.C. in April, it's something uh, to keep an eye out for. And I assume there they'll, they'll be able to present the, the results of this efficacy study. So any questions about what I just presented before I go on to some last other things? Okay, so where do we go from here? So I've showed you that small changes in instruction can make huge impacts. Um, but again, I want to drive home that I think that there's a lot of open questions around how do we combine these principles within a classroom, within a curriculum, across a school year, across years of schooling, that, that cognitive development piece is central. And you know, how does all of this work that we've done in the laboratory fit in in pre-K you know, all the way up to post-secondary and even adult education. That's a, a really open uh, set of questions. I also think that as we move basic research forward, there are going to be possibilities that we can't predict now for understanding how students learn and then how to maximize that ability. So as an example, I think our um, knowledge of executive function from the work that's been done in cognitive neuroscience has really, um, you know, that, that work has continued to build and it's gotten it to a point where it can be brought into the education research space. So we've seen a number of successful CASEL projects that have focused on executive function. And I think that that is coming from the excitement in the field uh, pretty recently around the basic science of that uh, process. So I think, again, the more we start to understand some other cognitive processes, you know, there's more potential then to move those into these applied domains like education. Um, and then the technological methodolog uh, methodology and, and statistics advances that we make in this field mean potentially new techniques for education research. So I talked a lot about eye tracking uh, in the context of reading, and that work would not have been uh, able to be done had we not been able to, to do a lot of uh, work with eye tracking in the basic science space. Um, and then also as the technology of eye tracking improved, you know, the ability to have just, you know, the the um, computer mounted version of eye tracking as opposed to the head mounted version. Um, those kinds of, of innovations allow for more applied work um, that asks these very uh, sensitive questions that could not be addressed through behavioral work. So again, as, as 
we continue along that trajectory, I think there's a lot of, of new techniques that could be brought to bear in education. Um, and then finally, I think we can do this now. Um, we are a valuable informational resource for curriculum developers, education technology developers, et cetera. So even if you don't think of yourself as an education researcher, um, know that you have a vast amount of knowledge that you can use uh, to collaborate with people who are interested in improving education and uh, that you can help improve those products. So um, I think especially in the education technology space, where things are just blowing up. There's tons of apps and, and things out there that are being developed. You know, being a part of that conversation is so important. We know so much about how people learn, and I think um, it's just not being used to its full potential in, in these spaces. Um, so the more that we can collaborate with those groups, I think the better. So if you are now uh, convinced that it's uh, worth applying to IES to do some of this work, I wanted to talk just briefly about what you might do next. So unfortunately, we don't have an open competition right now. Um, our latest competition closed um, in August, but we are anticipating having a competition that would be held um, next calendar year, so in 2016, uh, with grants that would be funded for fiscal year 2017. So grants would typically start in the spring to summer of 2017. Um, announcements for that will likely go out sometime in the winter to early spring of 2016. And so I'll give you some resources that you can go to to find all this. So. The first thing you'll want to do then um, when that announcement comes out is read the request for applications. However, since that's not yet out, I would strongly urge you to take a look at the um, fiscal year 2016 competitions request for applications. We tend to keep a lot of the requirements the same across years. There are some things that might deviate, but the main structure of our competition stays very constant. So I would urge you to take a look at, at the 2016 uh, funding competitions RFA and just get a sense of what those requirements look like, what the application uh, requires. Identify the topic and goal of your work. If it's cognition and student learning, that's easy, great, but there are a number of other topics one could apply to um, and, and it's worth taking a look at some of those. Um, identify the goal, that is the exploration, development, etc. cetera, uh, goal of your work. And then you would contact the program officer for the topic you're applying to. Um, as I said at the beginning, we as program officers don't participate in the review process. We have a separate office that does that. What that means is we can help you um, throughout the entire process of your preparing the application. We can talk to you about your ideas, give you feedback about them. We do sit in on the panel discussions and we see the reviews. So we have a really, um, we have really strong expertise in kind of understanding what reviewers are looking for and giving you tips about how to improve the quality of your application so that you're putting the best application forward for your idea. Um, so if it's cognition and student learning that you're interested in applying to, you would reach out to me. Um, we have program officers for each of the topics and, um, and so uh, that information is in the RFA. So if it's another topic like post-secondary and adult education, go into the RFA and you can find their contact information. And then lastly, I would urge you to start early in recruiting schools to participate in your work and get letters of support from those schools. So um, across all of the research goals, while you can do some limited laboratory work in some of them, you are required to do at least some of your work in authentic education settings. And in fact, I would say, you know, to, you would want to do a lot of the work in those settings um, with kind of some work in the laboratory. So, uh, so it's important to have school partnerships. If you've never recruited schools before, I would strongly urge you to talk to people in the department or in your college of education uh, and potentially set up collaborations with people who have experience going into schools uh, because it's, it's just a much easier process, I think, to work with someone who has experience in, in doing that. And then here are some castle specific things that I would urge you to think about. So first, um, if you're used to applying to NSF and even NIH, I think, um, you know, you kind of put the basic research motiv motivation forward and first, and that's how you frame your application. And then the broader impacts piece is where you say, oh, and this could apply to education. 
in IES's way of doing things, I think that you would want to instead start with an education issue and then identify the work from cognitive science that could inform it. So it's a different way of framing, and I think it's a really critical one to think about when you start thinking about your work and how it could apply here. Um, I also want you to think about the fact that education research is inherently interdisciplinary. And um, while we are used to, as cognitive scientists, being you know wearing many hats and doing everything, um, education research is complex. So, for example, there are methodologists and statisticians from maybe your college of education who have expertise in handling the nested design that you might need to develop uh, because of your working, your working in school. Um, and then the kinds of analyses you do are going to look very different from what you might do in the laboratory. In addition, having curriculum experts or content experts would be useful so that you're pulling a little bit from the education research uh, areas that, that you're interested in. So there's been work that's been done that you might not have come across, let's say, for example, in math, um, and you'll want to be knowledgeable about that. And so I think pulling in a partner who has that expertise is useful. If you're developing an educational technology, then, of course, having an ed tech developer of some kind is useful. Um, so as applicable to your project, but definitely think about an interdisciplinary team. And then another thing to think about as you formulate your ideas is that practitioners have really valuable insights. And I think that we can do more as researchers to integrate them into our work. So some really successful development projects that I've seen do things like have focus groups of teachers and they, and they take a lot of time to get feedback from teachers along the way to ensure that what they're doing is feasible in the classroom and uh, has generalizability and is practitioner friendly. So integrate these practitioners into what you plan to do, but also interact with them prior to applying. You know, sometimes people come in with assumptions about what business as usual instruction looks like in a classroom and they're surprised when they actually go in and observe that, that teachers are already doing things that they thought maybe teachers weren't doing or vice versa. So it, Take some time, find out about the space that you're going to work in and, and really interact with those people. Um, and then relatedly, think about how you'll move, if you choose to do so, from the laboratory to the classroom and back again. Some people choose to work only in schools, and that's great. Other people do this mix of lab and classroom work, especially in the exploration role, and that's also fine, but I think you need to have a strong rationale for how much laboratory work you do, when you choose to go to the laboratory versus moving into the classroom, et cetera. So those are things to think about. And then finally, um, a th an issue that IES has been uh, focused on a lot over the last couple of years has been this issue of dissemination to multiple stakeholders. So uh, we need to think about better ways to translate what we know to education researchers outside of the communities we typically talk to, to policymakers, practitioners, and any other stakeholders that uh, that might be relevant for the work that you're doing. So um, as part of your application to IES, um, you are required to propose a dissemination plan as part of the work. And so uh, we're urging people to really think about ways to reach these kinds of audiences um, and go beyond the journal paper and the typical conferences. Um, you know, it, it's going to depend on the kind of findings that you have, obviously. You know, if you're doing an exploration project, you wouldn't want to go out and start making claims about adopting particular curricula. But, you know, there are things that you can learn from exploration projects that might be useful for policymakers as they make decisions about particular things. So, again, thinking about how to get into these conversations, the ways that you can do it, the kinds of um, resources that you have at your institution that you could leverage, for example, a PR office or something like that, um, is, is valuable to think about as you, as you plan this uh, application. So a couple of resources I'll, I'll leave you with and then we can talk for the rest of the time as a you know discussion about any other questions you have. So here's our website, ies.ed.gov. Um, I don't have this on, on here, but if you hover over news and events, there's a link to the news flash. And uh, you can sign yourself up for our news flash, which gives you um, basically all the information about our grant competitions as we roll it out. So 
Um, if we release an RFA, you would get a news flash alert that says we've released the newest RFA. You can go here to find it. So again, that's hovering over news and events. You'll see the link. We also have a blog now. So here's the link to our blog. We blog about any number of things. So we blog about our training programs, as you see here. Um, we blog about different grants that are, um, you know, nice examples of, of things that we're trying to, t to push or talk about. Um, we blog about the competitions that are currently being run. Lots of different things. It's worth following. Um, and you can um, submit questions if you have follow up to the blog. So we, we want it to be interactive. And then uh, we have a Twitter account as well, and we post things like if a uh, um, PI has a new paper out and there's a news a press release about it, we'll post the link to the press release, that kind of thing. So it's another good thing to follow if you're on Twitter um, and you're interested in kind of seeing what people are up to who are being funded by IS. We also post things like, hey, Erin is at this conference giving a talk on funding if you want to meet with her. Yeah. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind when you follow this. And then we also have our What Works Clearinghouse, um, which, if you don't know, is um, is a really great resource intended for a number of different audiences. And I think it's something that, at least in the practitioner world, if you know about IES, this is what you know about. Um, they, at the What Works Clearinghouse, they'll publish things like practice guides, which are intended to summarize what we know about a particular area and make uh, practice kinds of recommendations. Um, we also, from here, uh, publish quick reviews of studies. We're most well known under the What Works Clearinghouse for the standards that are set for efficacy studies. Um, and so, we, um, well, not we, but who, you know, the people who do do the What Works Clearinghouse work um, will look at studies and say this meets What Works Clearinghouse standards or it doesn't, and that can be used as a criteria for deciding whether or not you should take the results of that study seriously and how much you can generalize those kinds of issues. And so lastly, here's our funding page. Uh, we update it with new RFAs as they come out. Currently, the FY16 RFA is up on that page. So if you're interested in checking that out in the meantime, while we don't have a competition going, certainly go ahead and uh, take a look there. And then, of course, you're all welcome to send me an email if you have uh, you know, any specific questions or ideas you wanted to throw at me. And um, we can set up a time to talk over the phone and, and talk through your ideas in more detail. I can also put you in touch with other program officers who might be more aligned to the kind of thing that you're thinking about. So I'll stop there and answer any other questions you have. Thank you.